Hello and welcome to the Thinking LSAT podcast in Los Angeles. I'm Nathan Fox. With me in Washington, D.C. is Ben Olson. Ben, what's going on? Not a whole lot. I'm excited to jump into these uh, these questions. Yeah, we've been getting some emails from listeners. Uh, we used to, way back in the day, episodes, um, wow, like we did them at the very beginning and then we did them in episodes 40 through... 91 we were doing logical reasoning questions from the june 2007 lsat Mm -hmm. and uh we haven't been doing it for a while because we've had this big backlog of emails but people have been writing in and clamoring for more uh logical reasoning explanations and i think we're going to even dive in today to some other stuff too so we might do some games we might do some reading comprehension but we're gonna uh we're gonna look at the june 2007 lsat yeah um, that test is freely available. You can Google it and you will find a PDF. You can print that test out. You can attempt that test on your own. Um, or you can just follow along, uh, as we go through these explanations. Yeah. Anything else we should say about that? No. Oh, um, th- I used the June 2007 test when I built my free, the free version of my online class. So if you go to foxlsat.com slash free, um, you'll have there's tons of explanations there of, of that correspond to the June 2007 LSAT. So, yeah. Um, and not to mention we've, we've already done almost every single one of the logical reasoning questions in our back uh, episodes. So, and we're going to finish that up today. Yeah. Uh, I used the June 2007 LSAT as well. So um, you can uh, check out my free course as well at strategyprep.com forward slash free. So yeah, and I people really ought to be doing both of those. I don't understand why you wouldn't yeah do those. It's free. It's a lot of free. Like I was talking to the, on the phone to a guy last night who wanted to buy my my online class, mm-hmm. and I was asking him if he had done my free class. Yeah, and no, he hadn't done the free class, but he wanted to buy the full class. Hmm. And I'm literally like trying to talk him out of buying my my class because I'm like, dude, you need to do the free class. Mm-hmm. Like if you're not going to do the free class, then I don't want you to pay for the full class because I, I want you to only do it if you're going to actually do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So do the work, people. Um, yeah. Strategyprep.com slash free. Foxlsat.com slash free. And then after that, fall in love with us and pay us. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> you want to start uh, here with section three? I believe we're on number yeah. 24. So I have a, a sociologist is saying something romantics who claim that people are not born evil, but may be made evil by the imperfect institutions that they form cannot be right. The sentence goes on, but normally I would stop here just to clarify what exactly these romantics are saying. And once I know what they're saying, I would then think about, how this person is saying that they are wrong because they cannot be right. Um, What are these romantics basically saying in your own words? Um, Yeah, they're, they're saying, um, well, the sociologist is saying Mm -hmm. romantics are wrong. And the thing that the romantics are wrong about, or these particular romantics who claim that people are not born evil, but may be made evil evil by the imperfect institutions that they form, Mm -hmm. that they're wrong about that. Now I, I would, I like personalize it. Right. I mean, I'm, I, I can't stop. I helped. I have to think about the church here. This makes me Mm -hmm. think of the church. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean that, Hey, you, you might not be evil to begin with. And I mean, I'm sorry for all of the religious folks out there, but The way, as you know, the way I see it as an atheist, I look at this and I go, oh, well, maybe they're talking about the church here that you're saying, well, you weren't evil to begin with, but then you formed this imperfect institution, the church, and then the church made you evil. Mm -hmm. Of course, it doesn't have to be the church. It could be school. It could be government. It could be any other institute. I mean, your motorcycle biker gang. Sure. You weren't evil before you started the Hells Angels, but then you did the Hells Angels and then the Hells Angels made you evil. Or communism, or socialism, or whatever group any, that you <laughs> want. Yeah, your look. bowling league. Yeah, any any institution 
So there are romantics who say that institutions make people evil. Even if you're not born evil, the institution can make you evil. Yeah. And the sociologist is going to conclude that they are wrong. Yeah. And so about that. by saying that they're wrong, this person either thinks that people are born evil or yeah. they are not made evil by the institutions in society that they have formed. Um, maybe they're made evil by something else or they were just born evil. So I don't know exactly what this person is taking issue with, but something in that claim, right? Uh, maybe all of it. The, the, so then it says four, and that's a, a common premise indicator. So we're, spe- we're about to get the reason why this person thinks they're wrong. They misunderstand the causal relationship between people and their institutions. After all, institutions are merely collections of people. Okay, so I'm going to try to understand this argument before I critique it, but basically the idea is that the institutions aren't making people evil uh, because the institutions are merely collections of people. In other words, they don't – the sociologist doesn't say this, but it sounds like what the sociologist is trying to say is that the institutions are evil because the people who created them are evil. Now, the sociologist doesn't say that, so this is that's kind of the problem, I think, with this argument. But the point here is that the person is trying to say that it's the causal relationship is flipped. People make institutions evil rather than institutions making people evil. Yeah, or I guess another way to read that might be, and we so we don't know, right? Mm-hmm. We can. It's okay to sort of have multiple different interpretations of what the sociologist is saying. Mm-hmm. It strikes me that it's possible that the sociologist is saying institutions are people, like that. There's no difference between the institution and the people. Mm-hmm. The institution is merely a collection of people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So to say the institution has made you evil, that's like saying people made you, made people evil. Yeah. Which is the same thing as saying people are evil. Mm -hmm. So maybe the sociologist is like trying to say that it's a tautology or circular reasoning. Yeah. I guess I was picking up But it could also be reversal. Yeah. I was thinking the reversal just because of the premise right before, right? Misunderstand the causal relationship between people and their institutions. But yeah, it could just be, hey, they're the same thing. Um, But the the sociologist never comes out and says – either of those things that we've sort of tried to deduce from the sociologist's claims, right? The sociologist has just said institutions are merely collections of people. Okay. Does that mean that people make institutions evil or that institutions make people evil? Uh, They could be collections and still end up – the collection somehow makes the individuals evil, right? Like once everybody gathers together, now they're making (laughs) each other evil, whereas separate – they would not have become evil. So I don't necessarily think this is a convincing argument. No, it's it's not and we're we're trying to make sense of it, right? Mm-hmm. That's our job. Yeah. We're the we're supposed to be the master of the argument and the sociologist has made an incomplete argument and we immediately start firing questions, really. Like what do you mean? Yes. Yeah. What are you trying to say here? What's where are you going here? I don't really think you know, you're trying to claim that these romantics are wrong. <clears throat> you certainly haven't proven that they're wrong. Yeah. You've raised some questions, but not enough to, to you know, nail it down. Right. So the question right. says, which one of the following principles, if valid, would most help to justify the sociologist's argument? Uh, this question has the word principle in it, but I would just treat it as a strengthening question. I think a lot of times people get confused by this phrase and they call this, oh, this is a special – Principle question or something like that. No, it's just saying which one of the following principles, which could be the same as which one of the following claims or statements, if valid, if true, would most help to justify the argument. In other words, which answer would most strengthen the argument? So this is just a strengthen question in my mind. Yep. Principle is not a magic word on the LSAT. Um, so this is just a strengthen question. Yeah. So as we go through the answers, we're going to look for something that sort of answers some of our concerns about the sociologist premises, right? 
just because they're a collection of people doesn't necessarily mean that the people now affect the institutions. Maybe the institutions still affect the people. So I'd be looking for an answer that says uh, if something is just a collection of people, then it is not affecting those people. The people are really affecting it or something like that. Um I'd also like an answer to be as strong as possible as long as it's relevant. So weaker answers might be wrong if they're not as strong as another answer that's also good. That's what I have in my mind. Do you have anything else in your mind before you go in? Yeah. Um, you know, there's, I think there's, there would be some um, very strong answers like uh, there is no difference between institutions and the people that form them. You know, something like that would sure. be like, how can you possibly be made evil by the institution if there's no difference between people and an institution that, you know, that they form? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, or <clears throat> something like um, institutions cannot cause anything to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That would be. That would be like, <laughs> well, then how did they possibly make people evil? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or people cannot be affected by the institutions they form. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Answer choice A. People acting together in institutions can do more good or evil than people acting individually. Okay. So my gut reaction to this answer is that it's wrong because the fact that they can do more good or evil than people acting individually doesn't really say what caused what it's just saying as a group, they're more effective. (laughs) It's, you know, the longer you spend analyzing the argument itself Mm -hmm. and really thinking about what their evidence was and what they're trying to conclude, Mm -hmm. the worse, the wrong answers start to look. Yeah. You, you, when we get to a, I mean, there is, I would not consider that answer. I would consider that answer for three seconds, literally. It's just not what it's about. It's not about whether institutions do good or evil. It's not about how you can have the most impact for good or evil, like whether it's better to work individually or work in an institution. I mean, a is just garbage. That is not even close to a good answer. Yeah. B, institutions formed by people are inevitably imperfect. Okay, great. I mean – Again, it's not about perfect or imperfect institutions. B, I mean, it almost, you could read it as a weakener here because the sociologist is like basically trying to defend institutions, right? Saying the institutions aren't causing people to be evil. Yeah. But B says institutions are imperfect, inevitably, always Mm -hmm. imperfect. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you could read B as a weakener. Uh, We're looking for a strengthener. It's, it can't be B. C, people should not be overly optimistic. What? Uh, This is about (laughs) what people think, right, or feel, and this conclusion is not at all about what people think or feel. It's about whether or not they were made evil by an institution or not. The the normative thing there, the should mm-hmm. in C, the sociologist did not say anybody should or should not do anything. So C saying people should or should not do things just can't possibly strengthen that argument. Yeah, you know, that's interesting that you point that out because uh, I think sometimes people wonder how they can get faster at logical reasoning. And basically, I there's two problems, at least there's probably more, but there's at least two problems with this answer choice. One has to do with beliefs versus facts, and the other one has to do with normative versus descriptive. And you're pointing out one of the problems. I'm pointing out another problem. If you know both of those problems, then you can get rid of this answer choice very quickly and confidently. It doesn't matter what you see first. It's gone. Uh, the less you know about the test, though, the more you sort of tend to entertain answers that are logically flawed. So I think that just goes back to our point of the more you can understand about this test and really get your mind wrapped around what's going on, the faster you can get rid of things. Yep. D, a society's institutions are the surest gauge of that society's values. Okay. <laughs> 
values. What? And D is like the best way to tell what a society's values are is to look at the institutions. Okay. So what? Yeah. It's if you understand the argument, then D just becomes irrelevant. It, it's not, that's not what we're taught. Who cares? Yeah. That's not the point of the argument. How does that help the sociologist argument? Yeah. E, the whole does not determine the properties of the things that compose it. In other words, and notice the verb phrase here, does not determine. That's exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about a causal claim here. The whole institutions do not determine the properties of the things that compose it. It does not determine the properties of the people. The evilness or lack of evilness. Yeah. Of the people that compose it. That's it. Yeah. E says the institution does not make people evil. Yeah. Okay. That's the answer. (laughs) It's pretty much restating the conclusion. (laughs) Yeah. And we also predicted it. I mean, that's, that's just right. Yeah. Uh, Here it's not the world's most difficult. I mean, it's hard to follow that argument. I think. The thing that you did, Ben, that I really liked there, one of the things you did that I really liked that I think students don't really catch on to is that you stopped before you were even done reading that first sentence. That first sentence is a lot. It's five lines. It's a lot of words. It's a premise and a conclusion. And you stopped at the comma there. Mm Mm-hmm. Which you, you, and you realized, oh, that's the conclusion of the argument. And you thought about it for a second. What are we talking about here? Institutions, like you think of an example, maybe of an institution. Mm -hmm. Can't this institution have this effect or not? The sociologist says, no, it can't. Okay, let's hear some evidence. And now you're sorting out the argument. Yeah. And that pause there is just worth everything. Because students are like, no, no, I have to hurry up. I have to get to the answer choices. Yeah. But you spent enough time with the five lines in the argument that then you just don't have to spend very much time at all on the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven lines in the answer choices. Yeah. There's more words here in the answer choices than in the argument itself. Mm -hmm. And you you do much better if you just take enough time with the argument that you just then don't have to. Cause I mean, it would have literally been, what do you think? Three seconds per A, B, C, D. Yeah. I mean, they're just not even close. They're garbage. If you understand the argument, they're garbage. And if you don't understand the argument, boy, good luck. Cause you're going to just spend forever bouncing back and forth between those answer choices. Yeah. And, and I have to say the reason I stopped is that, This last phrase in the conclusion says, uh, romantics who claim that people are not born evil, but may be made evil by the imperfect institutions that they form. That is just, it's, it's not that hard to understand now that we've thought about it. I mean, it's not that complicated in terms of a set of words, but when you're just reading through it, like I have to stop and just make sure that that image in my mind becomes crystal clear as opposed to just sort of like, oh, yeah, okay, I know this is about imperfect institutions and people and evil. That's the the kind of cloudy imagery that the LSAT plays off of, right? Because then all these other answer choices touch on something that's loosely connected with the vague notion you have of what you just read. Yep, totally. Cool. Uh, so should we do another one? Yeah, let's do it. Number 25. Um, some anthropologists argue that the human species could not have survived prehistoric times if the species had not evolved the ability to cope with diverse natural environments. Um, and I, I feel a but coming here. Yeah. Right. It says some anthropologists argue. So that's sort of telegraphing that this argument might say, but they're wrong because. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So these anthropologists are arguing that the human species could not have survived prehistoric times if they hadn't 
uh, evolved the ability to cope with diverse natural environments. Mm -hmm. And I'm expecting they're going to say, but that's wrong because. Yeah. So here it comes. However, there's the but. However, there is considerable evidence that Australopithecus afarensis, a prehistoric species related to early humans, also thrived in a diverse array of environments, but became extinct. Uh Uh-oh. Don't do it. (laughs) They're going to do it, huh? They are going to do it. They're going to do it. And what we're going to, what, what they're going to do here is they're going to confuse sufficient for necessary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the LSAT's most common flaw. And you got to be tuned into this one because that's the answer. I mean, they're, they're going to do it. Yeah. Uh, hence, the anthropologist's claim is false. So, <clears throat> see, these anthropologists are claiming that in order to survive prehistoric times, you have to have evolved the ability to cope with diverse natural environments. In other words, evolving the ability to cope with diverse natural environments is necessary in order to possibly survive. Or if you don't evolve that ability, then you won't survive. That's what the anthropologists are claiming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This speaker is saying that that is wrong. And the evidence for that conclusion is, hey, well, look at this species, Australopithecus afarensis. Mm-hmm. And you look at that species. I mean, they did evolve the ability to cope with diverse natural environments, but they did not survive. They became extinct. Yeah. So therefore, the anthropologists are wrong when they claim that evolving the ability to cope with diverse natural environments is necessary for surviving prehistoric times. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's a classic uh, confusing sufficient for necessary. It's the LSAT's most common flaw. It's on every single test. You are not going to be as successful as you could be with the LSAT if you don't learn uh, that flaw. Yeah. Uh, It is a flaw question. It says the reasoning in the argument is most vulnerable to criticism on the grounds that the argument, what? I mean, see here, I I knew already that that was, obviously this was going to be a flaw question. And the answer is you have confused sufficient for necessary. Mm A, it confuses a conditions being required for a given result to occur in one case with the conditions being sufficient for such a result to occur in a similar case. What do you think about that answer, Ben? Well, it uh, describes a necessary and sufficient condition mix-up, and we're talking about one case, maybe our ancestors versus another case, this this other prehistoric species. So I would, I would actually probably just keep it open and say it seems like a very possible answer, but then just go through and eliminate the rest. Um, yeah, it's it it is talking about the flaw of confusing necessary for sufficient or confusing sufficient for necessary. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, unless there's another answer that also describes the sufficient and necessary flaw, I think the answer is going to have to be A. Yeah. Um notice here that the one case and the other case mm-hmm. we don't know which case is which, right? Like I'm not sure the order really matters. Yeah, I do, well, if it, I mean, now that we're thinking about it a little bit more, it does seem like the one case is it, it probably. I, I see what you're saying. It, it may not matter, but I could also easily see it fitting with the one case referring to humans because the first sentence did seem to establish this necessary condition, which is what they say at the beginning of this answer choice. Yeah, uh, I, I wouldn't think. I actually wouldn't think about it too deeply. <laughs> until I found another answer that I thought could possibly be yeah, exactly. describing the sufficient and necessary I agree. flaw. And that's and then there and then you dig in and say, hmm, okay, does this seem to fit? Because that's actually pretty rare. It has happened, but it's pretty right, rare. Exactly. In most cases when you're talking about sufficient and necessary, that's the only answer choice they give you. And I mean, I guess there could be another answer choice that might talk about an assumption and you ask yourself, okay, is that assumption the same kind of assumption that they're incorrectly making here. But as long as it's not, then we don't need to worry about these other answer choices. Right, right. Yeah, so it's funny because it's either a really easy question and the answer is A, 
or there's going to be another answer that is going to be a better description of the sufficient necessary flaw. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be an, one of these exceptionally hard questions. Yeah. And the answer is going to be something else. But w I think we're on the same track here. We would look at that. We'd go, well, yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. And then we just mm -hmm. make sure we can get rid of B, C, D, E. Yeah. Okay. B. <clears throat> takes for granted that if one species had a characteristic that happened to enable it to survive certain character, uh, certain conditions, then at least one related extinct species must have had the same characteristic. Uh, no, it didn't necessarily assume that it, it didn't do that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like the way, I mean, you taught me how to, your, your method for flaw questions, I stole from you, you know, two years ago now where you would say, did they do this? Mm -hmm. And then is it a problem? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And with B, I just don't think it's fair to say that. Yeah. Like, Hey, you've taken for granted that if one species had this characteristic, then there must be another extinct species that had also that characteristic. That's right. What? They didn't do that. I mean, now they did talk about a species that survived and they did talk about a species that's extinct. But they didn't say because this one species had this characteristic that enabled it to survive. Therefore, another species had to an extinct species has to have this same. No. Yeah. They just didn't do B. Mm -hmm. OK, so B's conclusively out. Cool. C generalizes from the fact that one species with a certain characteristic survived certain conditions. I think that's already wrong, but that all related species with the same characteristic must have survived exactly the same conditions. What? No, similar maybe, but not exactly the same. Yeah. And it wasn't generalizes in this answer choice could be replaced with, um, concludes. Right concludes from the fact that yada yada yada. Yeah, that's really what makes it wrong. Oh, that's one of the things that makes it wrong. I think yeah. is that it's not stating a fact that if you have a certain characteristic, you survive certain conditions, mm -hmm. and then then reasoning from that fact mm -hmm. to all related species must have done the same. Thing. No, yeah, it's like there's two problems right there. One, that premise didn't exist, and two, that conclusion wasn't about all <laughs> related species. Yeah. It was just about these <clears throat> anthropologists being false. Yeah. This argument is actually questioning a generalization. Yeah. Not assuming a generalization to be true and then reasoning from that generalization. Okay. So C's out as well. D fails to consider the possibility that Australopithecus afarensis had one or more characteristics that lessened its chances of surviving prehistoric times. Um, so here's the thing about fails to consider the possibility. Fails to consider the possibility answer choices are almost always things that the argument has done. <laughs> the argument right. failed to address lots of things. Uh, it failed to consider lots of different possibilities. It failed to consider the possibility that Santa likes cookies more than carrots. Yep. But yep. the fact is, does that matter? So it kind of turns this answer choice into a weakener. And the question is, does this weaken the conclusion? Um, even if it had one or more characteristics, it lessens its chances of surviving prehistoric times. I'm having trouble seeing how that would affect the conclusion which seemed to treat these things as sufficient it treated this yeah. this characteristic as sufficient to guarantee their survival so if it is truly sufficient who cares whether it had other characteristics that lessens its lessened its chances um yeah, sufficient if, if that is sufficient. lessened <laughs> if that lessened said eliminated then i think d would become a lot stronger answer because it would be like, well, wait a minute, Australopithecus afarensis had this one characteristic that made it devastated its chances of surviving prehistoric times. Mm -hmm. But lessened, I mean, how do we know that 
um, humans didn't have one or more. I'm sure we did have one or more characteristics that lessened our chances of surviving prehistoric times. Mm -hmm. That's not the point. The point is we have to have learned. It's necessary that we have learned to evolve, to um, exist in different environments or else we wouldn't have survived prehistoric times. You pointing out that Astropolithicus, Astrolopithecus, sorry, <laughs> that it had one or more of these negative characteristics. So what? Yeah. It, it, yeah, it just doesn't weaken the argument very much. You know, and, and here's another, it's like, you got to double down on this predicting the answers kind of a thing. We we knew that the argument had made the LSAT's most common flaw, mm-hmm. which is confusing, sufficient, and necessary. A is describing the sufficient and necessary flaw. D, <laughs> if you have any reason to be skeptical of D, it's probably just not D. Yeah. I I feel like if something truly is sufficient for guaranteeing survival, then it wouldn't these other things wouldn't matter. Wait, but the, the, the anthropologists aren't arguing that it's sufficient. They're arguing that it's necessary. Uh, the anthropologists are, but um, this person acts as if it's... Suf- is confusing that and saying it's sufficient. Yeah. Right. I see what you're because, saying. Because, oh, they okay. had this characteristic, but they became extinct. That's so messed up. They should have... Um, they should have survived if you were right. In other words... Oh, therefore, the anthropologist claim is false. Yeah. Right, right, right. Okay, yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I get it. You're, like, giving credit to... You're, like, saying, well, if you're right, <laughs> then you're then you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Okay. <clears throat> Let's move on. E fails to consider the possibility that even if a condition caused a result to occur in one case, it was not necessary to cause the result to occur in a similar case. I really don't like that they're talking about causation. Mm -hmm. I mean, the given argument was about sufficient and necessary. Yeah. And it confused sufficient for necessary. He's talking about sufficient and necessary and causation in the same premise or in in the same answer. Yeah. I think people I mean, get confused about about that all the time because they think that if then statements are causal, right? Like if I go outside, then it will rain. People immediately think I'm saying that somehow my going outside is what caused it to rain, but all I'm saying is that these two events are highly correlated. <laughs> so much so that if I go outside, it will definitely rain, but we have no idea why, right? Which is a causal claim. Right. Yeah. So sufficient and necessary do not, they do not at all have to be causal. I mean, if you're in Los Angeles, then you are on planet earth. Mm -hmm. That's an if then statement, Yeah. but it's not really even sensible to say, therefore Los Angeles causes you to be on planet earth. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's not, no, you, you were born a human being on planet earth and being in Los Angeles is not causing you to be on earth. You were never not on earth. So <clears throat> I, yeah, I feel like ease over complicating things. It's getting this new concept of causation involved. We predicted the answer. The answer is confusing, necessary, and sufficient. A is describing confusing, necessary, and sufficient. A is the most straightforward answer. Uh, my answer here is a, I agree. I am just going to say one more thing about E when yep. it starts out by saying fails to consider the possibility that even if a condition caused a result to occur in one case, I would stop there and say, okay, wait, did they ever say that a condition caused a result to occur in one case? I feel like they were just saying that the ability to cope was a necessary condition, not a sufficient condition, not something that right. would cause you to survive. It was just right. something that you needed to survive. Um, and so right there it's, and eh, this isn't happening. Wrong. Perfect. Very good. So we have found reasons to eliminate B, C, D, E. A is describing the sufficient necessary flaw, which we, I mean, we saw that before we were even done reading the argument. Yeah. And so the answer is A. Cool. 
Awesome. Well, do you want to move on to, uh, you want to talk about one of these games or do you want to talk about one of these reading? Oh, I don't care either way. All right. Um, maybe let's just do reading comp since it's the next section. Sure. Section four. Um, and yeah, we are going to do passage number two. Yes. No, we already did passage number two. So now we're going to do passage number three. So this is the World Wide Web one. This is going to be the World Wide Web one. Awesome. <laughs> How do you want to do this? Should I just start reading? Well, you were yawning, so I'll read. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The World Wide Web, a network of electronically produced and interconnected or, quote, linked sites called pages that are accessible via personal computer raises legal issues about the rights of owners of intellectual property, notably those who create documents for inclusion on web pages. Funny how dated that is. Huh? Yeah, no kidding. It's like explaining what the World Wide Web was. This was in 2007. Um, interesting. Okay. Uh, what's this passage going to be about? Uh, it's going to be about IP legal issues. And they're going to say that the web has created uh, some, I don't know, I guess like, you know, it's new technology. It's created some new legal issues. Mm -hmm. Basically, um, what rights do owners of IP have when people create documents for inclusion on web pages? Yeah. Okay. Some of these owners of intellectual property claim that unless copyright law is strengthened, intellectual property on the web will not be protected from copyright infringement. And right away, I'm thinking, because I'm really hungry for the author's main point, right? I'm really looking for the author's attitude. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the second sentence here gives a claim from the owners of intellectual property. Some of these owners mm -hmm. claim that copyright law has to be strengthened. Yeah. Or else the web is going to fuck up their copyright, basically. Yeah. I'm anticipating that the author is going to disagree with that. Mm -hmm. Because, again, it's like when you show up on the LSAT saying some people say, mm -hmm. you almost always end up going, no, on the other hand, this. Yeah. So if I had to predict here, which is something that I do a lot to increase my reading comprehension, I make predictions as I read. Mm hmm and I'm predicting the author's going to say, actually, we don't need to strengthen copyright law. Like there's some other way to protect these copyright owners or fuck the copyright owners. We don't need to protect them. Mm -hmm. Something like that is what I'm anticipating. Yeah. You have anything to add to no. that? Uh, that's exactly okay. what I'd be doing. And that's how you do it too, yeah. right? I mean, you're engaged. Like it's, hey, guess what, folks? We are actually understanding what we're reading here. That's, it's called reading comprehension and we are comprehending. <laughs> Yep. Um, web users, however, claim that if their ability to access information on the web pages is reduced, the web cannot live up to its potential as an open, interactive medium of communication. Okay. So in the, at the end of the first paragraph, we have a, a conflict here between owners of intellectual property who want copyright law strengthened to protect from copyright infringement on the web and then we have web users who, of course, say, no, 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 the web needs to be free and open and interactive. And if we strengthen copyright law and don't have access to this information, then the web is not going to live up to its potential. Yeah. So we now know pretty much what this passage is going to be about. <laughs> we know the topic for sure. And what we don't know yet is which side the author comes down on. Yeah, but we've... I'm predicting the author is going to say, well, after that second sentence, you know, it's like now the web users are making this other claim. So it might be some sort of middle ground or it might be, be. one side is right. One side is wrong or both are wrong. We'll see. Yeah. We haven't found out yet, but we, by the time we get done, I'm expecting that we're going to have an answer to, well, what does the author think is the right thing here? Do we, or do we not need to strengthen copyright law? as it pertains to the web. Yeah. One thing to point out here is that this might seem like a lot of discussion. And of course, the discussion is going to take way longer than what would happen if you were just reading this on your own. But I still feel like this illustrates uh, what generally happens for me. And that is, uh, and I'd be curious if this is what happens for you as well, but I feel like it's an upside down triangle when it comes to effort. 
I'm putting in a lot of effort in the first few sentences to get oriented, to try to figure out where the author seems to be going with this. And then as I understand more and more the amount of effort that I have to put in to understand what's being said and where the author is going decreases. So I look at it as like a triangle of effort and that triangle is upside down. So there's a lot more effort up front. And then by the end of the passage, I'm pretty much cruising through the sentences and um, not usually being surprised uh, by what the author says next. Yeah. I like that a lot. I mean, the, the upside down triangle that does make a lot of sense. Um, yeah. By the time you get to the end of the passage, you're kind of going, yeah, yeah, I, I, I get it. I see where you're going. I, I've, I know where you've gone. I've, I predicted where you were going to go. I know what you're talking about. Like I know the topic, but now I also understand where you're falling, where, where I understand. once you get the author's opinion, right. Then the rest of the thing kind of flows from yeah. that. You can follow along with their argument here. So right now we've got the topic set up. And we still don't know where the author is going to come down, but we're expecting the author is going to come down one side or the other or some compromise solution. And then, yeah, it should get a lot easier to read the rest of the passage later. Yeah. Okay, good point. The debate arises from the web's ability to link one document to another. Links between sites are analogous to the inclusion in a printed text of references to other works, but with one difference. The cited document is instantly retrievable by a user who activates the link. So we've got an analogy now, like you can uh, reference another book, like you're writing a book and you can say, you know, as so-and-so said in such and such work. Mm -hmm. And a link on a website is very similar to that, except for one difference that the author wants to specifically point out here, which is this instant retrievability. Mm Mm-hmm that you click that link and you are immediately on that other document. This immediate accessibility creates a problem. Okay. So what's the problem? Since current copyright laws give owners of intellectual property, the right to sue a distributor of unauthorized copies of their material, even if that distributor did not personally make the copies. We have an example here. If person A, the author of a document, puts the document on a web page and person B, the creator of another web page, links, uh, sorry, creates a link to A's document, is B committing copyright infringement? Oh, and that's a question. So it's not an example. It's that's that's the issue that we're we're really struggling with here. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know what how I know how I would react to that. Um, well, my personal reaction at first is, wow, this, this seems dated because this question (laughs) has been, and I hadn't realized it, but it has been asked and answered, right? Like person A who has this document has put it on the web and has control over it. So even though person B is linking to it, uh, if person A has an issue with that, they can easily remedy that, you know? So I don't feel like this is much is as much of a debate as this person thinks, but I understand that they're grappling with this issue. And so I'm curious. In 2007, in, they were, yeah. <laughs> or at least people who were writing the LSAT thought that the web was grappling with this issue <laughs> uh, at the time the iPhone was released. But um, yeah, so I... I do understand the question, but I, I feel like in hindsight, it's already been answered. It doesn't mean that's the- clear. Just clearly not. Yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, if you don't want me to link to your shit, then don't put your shit on the internet. Yeah. Basically. Right. I mean, nowadays all everybody tries to do is get yeah. links to their shit. <laughs> <laughs> You're linking to me. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Cause ultimately then, you know, that the person is just directing the other, the viewer to, uh, a, the real problem is when person B steals A's content and puts it on B's web page or website. Or right, then. which back in the day that we didn't, you know, the, uh, let's give them credit. You know, they didn't originally know. I mean, maybe in 2007, they this was well settled, but maybe in 97, yeah. it wasn't that settled that if you put a link and they can, well, they click right to it. Well, then are they stealing from you? 
you yeah. know, when you do that, are you stealing their stealing their ideas or whatever? Yeah. And apparently, it was this was actually a question back in the day. Now we've recognized that you know there's no better attribution than a link, mm-hmm. and that <laughs> you're 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 definitely not stealing to stealing from somebody. You're just sending them to a different website. Yeah. So, um, okay. Anyway. At the time, this was a question, and we still haven't found out what the author thinks. Yeah. The author just thinks, hey, here's a problem. <clears throat> to answer this question, it must first be determined who controls distribution of a document on the web. When A places a document on a web page, this is comparable to recording an outgoing message on one's telephone answering machine for others to hear. <laughs> answering machines. Oh, it's funny. This is where the the analogy actually probably makes more people more confused than the original idea. Given yeah, the, kids these days, like, huh? Wait, what? answering machine. What's and that? I have to try to understand what was going on then. <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay, but I understand the. I, I mean, I get the analogy. I do remember um, answering machines and. Uh, I, I understand the analogy. Okay. When B creates a link to A's document, this is akin to B's giving out A's telephone number, thereby allowing third parties to hear the outgoing message for themselves. Anyone who calls can listen to the message. That is its purpose. While B's link may indeed facilitate access to A's document, the crucial point is that A, simply by placing that document on the web, is thereby offering it for distribution. And that's exactly what, uh, Ben, you were saying. Yeah. Therefore, even if B leads others to the document, it is A who actually controls access to it. Hence, creating a link to a document is not the same as making or distributing a copy of that document. And there we have the author's opinion. Yeah. And it, you just have to train yourself to catch that. That it this is not the author parroting somebody else's argument is this is not here's what web users say yeah. this is the author just saying it yeah the author here is answering the question the author just gave you their main point which is basically i mean they haven't stated it explicitly but no it is not copyright infringement when you link to somebody else's document there's so many clues here i mean first of all the question yeah. Sometimes authors will ask a question and then they won't tell you what they think the answer is. They'll tell you what other people think the answer is and they'll do that to the end of the passage. But even that, recognizing that the author never told you what she thought in terms of the answer to that question but only told you what other people think the answer to that question is, is a good thing to recognize. You're like, oh, so the point of this passage is that there some people think X and other people think Y. As opposed to, oh, you've now told me what you think, author, therefore the point of this passage is that, right? So right. being tuned in, like you said, Nathan, earlier in the passage, being tuned in to what the author is trying to say, what the author believes or thinks is what this is all about. And then we have these words, therefore and thus, or therefore, hence, um, It's just big red neon signs, right? Like, hey, I'm about to tell you what I think, and I'm not attributing this to somebody else. Yeah, yeah. Moreover, techniques are already available by which A can restrict access to a document. For example, A may require a password to gain entry to A's webpage, just as a telephone number, sorry, just as a telephone owner can request an unlisted number and disclose it only to selected parties. So again, this author is clearly saying it is not copyright infringement. Making a that's saying A controls the access, A controls the document. You don't have to put it on the web in the first place if you don't want people to access it. You could even put it on the web with a password. Yep. So no, a link is not copyright infringement. Um, Such a solution would compromise the openness of the web somewhat, but not as much as the threat of copyright infringement litigation. And the solution, the password solution. Yeah. It's like, well, of course, if they wanted to protect this with a password, then, you know, that's compromising the openness of the web. But according to this author, Mm -hmm. 
not as much as this looming threat of copyright infringement litigation would. Yeah. The author is anticipating some chilling effect. If, uh, if links could be potentially copyright infringement, then basically I think the author is saying no one would link ever. And then the web would definitely not be open. Yeah. Um, okay. Changing copyright law to benefit owners of intellectual property is thus ill-advised because it would impede the development of the web as a public forum dedicated to the free exchange of ideas. And so they're even, even stronger. And specifically this author does not want the copyright law changed to benefit owners of intellectual property. Yeah. That is ill-advised. Why are you wasting my time with all of this? You know, what's the point? Yep. It's basically the last sentence. Yeah. Um, What is this about? What does the author want? The author does not want copyright law to be changed to benefit owners of intellectual property. Yeah. Number 15, surprise, surprise, asks us for the main point of the passage. Yep. Notice how long those answer choices are. Mm -hmm. and it's it's like if you really deeply engage with each of these answer choices you're going to be spending a lot of time wading through the muck Mm -hmm. only one out of five of these is right four out of five of them are wrong we have a prediction and i think we need to go in here looking for our prediction and just really quick to pull the trigger on wrong answers yeah so a since distribution of a document placed on a web page is controlled by the author of that page rather than by the person who creates a link to the page, creating such a link should not be considered copyright infringement. Hmm. I don't hate it. Yeah, it's not inaccurate, but I'm afraid it would be too narrow. That I would keep it open, be but be very. I would very skeptical that it's the ultimately the right answer because it seems like one of the narrow points as opposed to the broader point that copyright copyright law should not be strengthened. Right. In the first paragraph, line six, we had owners of intellectual property claiming that it's necessary that we strengthen copyright law. And the author goes all the way to saying, absolutely not, do not change the copyright law. Yeah. And A doesn't have anything about whether we should or should not strengthen the copyright law. Yeah. This is like an inter- this is like an intermediate conclusion in the middle of that third paragraph. Yep, it's part of the argument for sure, but it's not it doesn't go far enough. Okay. B, changes in copyright law in response to the development of web pages and links are ill-advised. If it stopped right there, that might be yeah. good. Unless such changes amplify <laughs> rather than restrict the free cha- exchange of ideas necessary in a democracy. Oh my gosh. We, that was like, Whoa. we're going on the right road and then er, turn left. <laughs> yeah, totally. Democracy, dude. Yeah. I don't, I do not think democracy was ever mentioned. I think they're hoping you read into this. You're like, yeah, yeah. yeah. You bring your own ideas of. Right. Like that's how I would make the decision. Well, no, that's not the point. The point is what did the author say? The author also, by the way, the author never said, don't do it unless no, blah, no, blah, no. blah. The author just said, don't do it because. Yeah. Okay. C. People who are concerned about the access others may have to the web documents they create can easily prevent such access. Yeah, yeah. But nothing there about whether the law should be changed or yeah. not. I think C, like A, is part of the argument. Too narrow. D. Problems concerning intellectual property rights created by new forms of electronic media are not insuperably difficult to resolve if one applies basic common sense. Oh my gosh, no, stop. Goodbye. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Goodbye. All right, E. Maintaining a free exchange of ideas on the web offers benefits that far outweigh those that might be gained by a small number of individuals if a radical alteration of copyright laws aimed at restricting the web's growth were allowed. What? Mm-hmm. 
<clears throat> it never really talked about the benefits. It just said that it was, you know, necessary, but it never said like, here are the benefits and that outweighs the, the cost. Yeah. Also radical alteration was never mentioned. Small number of individuals was never mentioned. He's just wacko. Yeah. So we didn't love any of them, but I know which one I like best. Okay. Which one do you like best? What do you think? Well, uh, I would, at this point I would go and I would get rid of the ones that I, I would that absolutely make me vomit. So I'd be like, okay, apparently I didn't like any of them for some reason. D and E for sure are gone. I think B is also I gone. I agree. I would be down to A and C and then I would just, because these are the two that we both said are accurate, but too narrow, right? Yeah, but I'm going to get, I'm going to, I'm going to read so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm pretty clearly snapping to one of these answers, though. Yeah, what, what's your thought? Well, A, when it said that creating a link should not be considered copyright infringement, mm. mm-hmm. should not l- be legally considered to be copyright infringement. In other words, we should not change the copyright law in order to call this link copyright infringement. Mm-hmm. Like C is so narrowly focused on, hey, put a password. Yeah. But D, or I'm sorry, but A is like, hey, is this or is this not copyright infringement? Yeah. yeah. I agree. And that's what the passage is about. So we're going to have to go. We didn't love A, but it just can't be anything else. And if you read A, which is a, a very sensible way to read A, mm-hmm. should not be considered copyright infringement. Yeah like should not be considered by courts to be copyright infringement. Yeah. Okay. Another way of thinking about this is this is what we identified as the intermediate conclusion, uh, which I guess the test writers are looking at this as the main conclusion, but C (laughs) was a premise for that, right? C like is supporting A A. versus A supporting C. So that's a great trick. If you ever narrow it down out there, uh, people, if you narrow it down to two here, if you narrowed it down to C to A and C, yeah. If you read C and then you say, therefore, mm-hmm. and then you read a, it's going to make sense. C is support for yeah. a, if you read it the other way around, a does not support C. So if they're both part of the argument and if one of them has to be the answer here for the main point, well, then it can't be C. It has to be. A. Yeah. Okay. Number 16. Which one of the following is closest in meaning to the term strengthened as that term is used in line eight of the passage? I'd have to go back here, I think. I don't remember why they said strengthened in line yeah, eight. Yeah, I agree. Some of the owners, I'm going back to line six here. I want to read the whole sentence. Some of these owners of intellectual property claim that unless copyright law is strengthened, intellectual property on the web will not be protected from copyright infringement. So do you try to make a prediction? Oh, I'm, sure. I'm going to make some sort of a oh. prediction here before I look at these yeah, answers, 100%. right? I mean, already I'm thinking to myself, what did they mean by the word strengthen here? They mean give... Strengthening copyright law. Yeah, they're, they're making it harder for people to get access to information. Right. Giving more protections to copyright owners, IP owners. Mm-hmm. And... Yeah, and thereby preventing people from being able to access stuff, being able to link to stuff, making the law more restrictive. Yeah. A says made more restrictive. Okay, keep that one. Keep that one. B, made uniform worldwide. That comes out of nowhere. Absolutely not. C, made to impose harsher penalties. Mm. That's a slightly tricky That's one. That's tricky because it sounds like, oh, if they're making it more, if they're making it harder to get copyrighted information, maybe they're doing that by making the penalties harsher. But we never, ever talked about penalties, so this is wrong. Yeah, that's not that's not what the, it was about the definition of copyright infringement. It wasn't about what the penalties should be for yep. copyright infringement. Okay. D, dutifully enforced. <laughs> um, we're not going to, this doesn't suggest that you change anything. It just suggests that you enforce what's already there. And that's not what we're talking about. 
Well, it was about the definition of the crime. It wasn't about like whether you are or are not going to enforce this this crime as defined. That's really interesting because answer choices A, C, and D touch on three different areas of the legal system, right? Like when you get convicted of a crime, that has to do with whether or not you committed a crime. Then you go into your sentencing phase, which is how much you will be penal penalized or what your penalty will be given the fact that you've committed that crime. And then dutifully, dutifully enforced has to do with whether the uh, you know enforcement arm of the government yeah, went or, after you or not, regardless. Whether the cop would give you – you're in San Francisco walking down the street smoking a joint and you know for 30 years, cops in San Francisco do not bust you for smoking yeah. weed. Right? That's the enforcement issue. Mm-hmm. Penalty is how much do they penalize you if they do enforce it. More restrictive is like the definition of the crime. Yeah, whether right? that's illegal or not. Right. By definition. By definition. Right. So <laughs> it has to be by definition le- illegal and then the cops have to give you a ticket and then the penalty has to be something that would actually prevent you from Welcome to the separation of powers. <laughs> but this whole passage is talking about um, the definition of the crime in the first place. Yeah. Uh, we haven't read E yet. More fully recognized as legitimate. <laughs> Nobody's questioning the legitimacy of copyright law, or at least that's not what this is about. Uh, it's about the definition of the crime. Strengthen. They wanted to strengthen the. Uh, they wanted to broaden the definition of copyright infringement to make it uh, make the laws more restrictive. I don't know why I find so these things a. funny. I'm sure it's because I'm only an LSAT geek, but like. I have to restrict my laughter in class sometimes sometimes because I've definitely done it where I'm like, oh my gosh, and everybody's like, Oh wait, that's the one I was tempted by. <laughs> oh, okay. No, I know, Let's but retract I'd like to and mock... go back and talk about No. I don't think you should apologize for that. I, I think it's good. It's good for them to learn that they have picked a just a horrible answer. I mean, they need to know why the answer is laughable. And so, yeah, I mean, I understand you don't want to insult them, but you're doing them a favor by, by showing them how bad that answer really was. Cause you're, you're supposed to show them how easy the test can be. Mm-hmm. It's not showing off. It's not bragging. It's just like, Hey, look, this answer is comedy. It's not even close. Yeah. As long as you can explain. Why. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 17 with which one of the following claims about documents placed on web pages would the author be most likely to agree? All right. I would be doing a loose prediction at this point. You? Yeah. And I would also be, I'm, I'm on guard here. That question stem puts me on guard a little bit. Why? And because, well, because this is an example of one of those questions where the, would the author be most likely to agree Mm -hmm. construction Mm -hmm makes certain students, especially really high performing students, they'll miss this question because they think they're supposed to speculate. Mm. And, and I just, this question is really a must be true question, you know, or as close as possible to a must be true. If there's one of these answers that the author explicitly said, yeah, that is the answer for sure. So I just I'm I'm careful when it's asking me to infer or that the author would be most likely to agree. Yeah. I'm just really careful here not to speculate too much. I want an answer that is grounded in evidence. Yeah. Oh, I agree. Okay. Okay. Anyway, you're you are also, and I would too, make a prediction. What do what what I mean basically what did the author say about documents placed on web pages? They are in the con- they are in control of the person who posted them, right? Person yeah. A. And yeah. so there's nothing to worry about them. If someone wants to link to them, great. If the person who owns that document wants to restrict it from other people linking to it, that's easy. They can just put a password protection on it. So I feel like a claim that the author would be likely to agree with would be something along the lines of those documents are fine. Those documents are adequately protected. Um, nothing needs to change. I don't know. Those are my loose predictions. Yeah, they're they're under the control of the person who put them there in the first place. That person doesn't have to put them on there in the first mm-hmm. place. That person can put a password if they want to, and that person does not need additional legal protections. Yep. Great. 
A, such documents cannot receive adequate protection unless current copyright laws are strengthened. And direct opposite. That's what you would pick if you were really trying to game it, by the way. Like if you skimmed, you know, mm. you didn't read, like you only read the first couple sentences and, and that's what you would think. That, well, that's what it's about. Yeah. Copyright owners claim that we have to strengthen the laws. So the answer yeah. is A. Yeah, but that's not the author's attitude. The author went the complete opposite direction. Yeah. B. Such documents cannot be protected from unauthorized distribution without significantly diminishing the potential of the web to be a widely used form of communication. No, this is unauth. Can, such documents cannot be protected from unauthorized distribution. Um, that's that's exact. I mean, this again is going against. This is going against what the author was saying. Yeah. The author said it's fine. Yeah. The author said, don't worry about the, it. If they can put a password, if they want, which will slightly diminish sure, the openness of sure. the web, but that's not to say that it's going to significantly diminish the potential of yeah. the web to be a widely used form of communication. It's just that, Oh, these documents, if you want to protect them, you can protect yep. them. So the, the B is too much like basically that the law should be changed. And that's not what the author yeah. wants. C, the nearly instantaneous access afforded by the web makes it impossible in practice to limit access. What? Again, the, the author said you could put a password. Yeah. D, such documents can be protected from copyright infringement with the least damage to the public interest only by altering existing <laughs> legal codes. No, they said keep the legal codes. Yeah, A and D are the exact opposite of what the author is yeah. saying. E, such documents cannot fully contribute to the web's free exchange of ideas unless their authors allow them to be freely accessed by those who wish to do so. I feel like this is the least least bad answer. I mean, it's the only one that the author didn't actively disagree yeah. with. So here I'm seeing, I mean, I, I, A, B, C, and D are just all must be falses. Mm -hmm. And this is basically a must be true question or as close as possible to, a, you know, yeah. I suppose you could call it a soft must be true if you really wanted to, but A, B, C, D are all must be false. And so E, you know, does the author agree that the documents are not going to fully contribute? I think that's a key word there. Fully. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sure. They can't fully contribute to the web's free. If the author puts a password or if the author doesn't put them on the web in the first mm -hmm. place. But it, it is another way of restating the author's main point, right? Which was, Hey, if, if the author wants this out there, they can just let it be out there. Mm -hmm. but the authors are under control, I guess is what that's another way of reading E is, Hey, the authors are under control. Yeah. Right. They're not going to be out there everywhere unless the author wants them mm -hmm. to be. That's basically what E yeah. says. Okay. 18. Based on the passage, the relationship between strengthening current copyright laws and relying on passwords to restrict access to a web document is most analogous to the relationship between what? You know what I immediately thought of as you were reading this is like the difference between using a sledgehammer and a scalpel. That's the analogy that came to my mind, you know? Hmm. Sure. Yeah. A scalpel is a s surgical tool. You can use it uh, judiciously, precisely, uh, precisely to just cut out exactly the things you want to cut out. Whereas a sledgehammer, you know, you can knock somebody's head off, <laughs> but that's not a good treatment for a brain tumor. Yeah, The scalpel would be a much better choice. I like that. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cause it seems like strengthening current copyright laws is imposing restrictions on everyone. It's a sort of a blanket move classic Washington, D.C. power play versus letting people uh, restrict what they want with passwords and the, you know, system working precisely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. I like it. A, uh, so we're looking for sledgehammer to scalpel. Mm -hmm. A, allowing everyone use of a public facility and restricting its use to members of the community. I don't, I don't like the beginning of that. It, no, it should say preventing. Yeah. 
if making a uh, strengthening copyright law would not make it available to everyone. <laughs> no, it would be the exact yeah. opposite of that. It would be closing down the public facility yeah. versus restricting its use to members of the community. Yeah. Um, so it's mm -hmm. not a B outlawing the use of a drug and outlawing its sale. It's outlawing both. Uh, yeah. C prohibiting a sport and relying on participants to employ proper safety gear. Okay, prohibiting a sport's pretty strong. Rel so that's like strengthening these copyright laws and just saying, hey, you can't link to anything. It's copyright infringement. Yep. That's prohibiting a yeah, sport. Yeah, don't play soccer anymore. Yep. Versus relying on participants to employ proper safety gear, relying on web owners or do owners of web documents to impose passwords when they want to. Yeah, be careful about what you put up. Uh, put a password if you need to. That's your proper safety. Yeah, order. I would keep this one open. But the sport, yeah, the sport will be allowed. Yeah, I like to see. I'm pretty sure that will be the answer. D, passing a new law and enforcing that law. Oh. E, allowing unrestricted entry to a building and then restricting entry to those who have been issued a badge. Again, that's backward. Yeah. A and E are very similar. Yep. And they're both wrong. Yeah. Okay, so it is C for 18. Yeah, cool. All right, 19. The passage most strongly implies which one of the following. Mm, basically, which one did the passage say? I mean, as close as possible. Yeah, you know? and here I don't... I just don't... Yeah, go ahead. I don't want to be reading between the lines here. I'm looking for one that it just feels like that's what they yeah. said. I don't... You usually have and a prediction. You don't have a yeah, prediction. Yeah, because the question itself is so generic. I'm just thinking, okay, I'm right. back to main point idea. <laughs> totally, but that's yeah. great. Yeah, so the the main point is we don't need to strengthen copyright law because the authors are in control. They can, re they can restrict what they put up. They can put a password if they need to. Don't change mm -hmm. the law. Okay, A, there are no creators of links to web pages who are also owners of IP on web pages. Hmm? yeah where did it say that where did it suggest that it, it never ever said that you know there's no walt disney would never link to something yeah. else no b the person who controls access to a web page document should be considered the distributor of that document i feel like that was actually said I think it definitely could have been said if, if nothing else, it fits exactly with what the author Very saying. close. Right. <laughs> and by the way, when we just restated the main point, that's exactly what we said. We, we immediately were talking about access. It's like, well, you can't, you don't have to put it there in the first place. Yeah. You could put a password if you want. You're the distributor of the document, not the person who links mm -hmm. to it. I think it's going to be B for sure. C rights of privacy should not be extended to owners of intellectual property placed on the web. <laughs> No, they can have privacy. They can put passwords on it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, man, privacy was also not ever even a word that was. It wasn't about. mentioned. So it's, you can get rid of it with that. But even if you try to squeeze it into the whole, like, keep your documents yeah. private, it's like, Access, should not yeah. be extended. No, they, they have, they it, have it. Yeah. We just don't need to change the law. They, yeah. Okay. D, those who create links to web pages have primary control over who reads the documents on those pages. I don't like primary. No. Well, it's also the exact opposite. Oh, who have? It's oh, yeah. The, sorry, I was reading it as those who um, <laughs> create the documents. The yeah, page. but those who create no. the links, yeah, no, they don't have primary control. D is the opposite of what the author yeah. said. E, a document on a web page must be converted to a physical document <laughs> via printing. <laughs> Sorry. before copyright infringement takes place. Sometimes I think they get tired. They're like, oh, I got to write one more wrong answer. Yeah, totally. Well, it must be hard to write all this <laughs> bullshit. E, e is not they the answer. They never talked about printing. No, no. Okay, so number uh, 19 then is definitely yeah. B. Number 20. According to the passage, which one of the following features of outgoing messages left on telephone answering machines is most relevant to the debate concerning copyright infringement? Okay, so again, we can predict here. Yeah, a feature of the outgoing message. So what was that supposed to be analogous to? That was analogous to the person um, 
so the the message creator is the same as the document creator and the phone number yep. is the same as uh, the public link that someone else could link to or call. Yeah, distributing the phone number is is like making a mm-hmm. link. So the feature of the outgoing message is, well, it's there for a purpose. Yeah. They put it there because they wanted people to hear the mm-hmm. message. If they didn't want people to hear the message, they could have not put the message. Yeah. Or they could have not distributed their yeah. phone number. A, such messages are carried by an electronic medium of communication. Okay, vomit. It's not about e. <laughs> the little yeah, well, electrons. That's true, but that's not that's not the point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. B, such messages are not Stop. legally protected <laughs> against unauthorized distribution. Um, okay. They just didn't say whether they are or yeah. aren't. Um, but anyway, that's certainly not the most relevant feature. That's not why they were talking about mm-hmm. it. C, transmission of such messages is virtually instantaneous? Nope. What? It's not about how fast they are. D, people do not usually care whether or not others might record such messages? <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> these are, wow, these are some terrible yeah. answers. E, such messages have purposely been made available to anyone who calls that telephone number. Yeah. That was their point. And it's also just like, that's again, that's restating, yeah. right? Because the argument said they're there for a yep. purpose. That was part of my prediction. They're there for a yeah. purpose. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's why the analogy makes sense. Because you recorded that message for a purpose. You put the web page up for yeah, a purpose. Yeah, so other people would see it and read it. That's why it's there, right. Okay, 21. The author's discussion of telephone answering machines serves primarily to what? Do you have a question? Yeah, so here? this is a – I consider this sort of like a role question or a primary purpose question, same thing. Sure. Uh, so you're trying to say, hey, what, what role was the telephone discussion playing in the argument as a whole? And since it was being used to support this person's argument, my short, very, very loose prediction would be, oh, it was a it was an analogy that's a being used as a premise to support the idea that specifically that this is um it's okay to link to these documents, basically. Yeah, I always end up going back to the main point. It's like if you get the if you're sucking at reading comprehension, I guarantee you're not really identifying strongly enough with the main Mm -hmm. point, Mm -hmm. their purpose, you know, the role played in the argument is to support eventually to support their main conclusion. What is their main conclusion? Why did they bring up the telephone answering machine? Well, it was an analogy and they were trying to prove that, Hey, the messages are there for a purpose, just like a web page is there for a purpose. We don't need to strengthen legal protection for this because there are other ways if you don't want the information out there, you don't have to put the message in the first place or you could have a private phone yeah. number. Yeah. And and so it's like it really just does come back to their main point. You either got it or you mm-hmm. didn't. Why did they bring up the telephone answering machine? To prove their main point. Yeah. What's their main point? Don't strengthen copyright law on the yeah. web. Okay. So was it there to compare and contrast the legal problems created by two different sorts of electronic Ugh. media? None of that. Was it to provide an analogy to illustrate the positions taken by each of the two sides in the copyright? Uh, I'd keep that open. Okay. It was an analogy, but I don't like the second half of B. I don't like the second half. I don't think that the... Yeah, I agree. Go ahead. I just don't think that the telephone answering machines... It it didn't say some people think that telephone answering machine messages should be protected legally from copyright infringement. You know, it didn't... It didn't do that, so I, I don't... Yeah, I'm so you're, you're focusing in on the word, the positions, right? Well, because it, I just don't... It was an analogy, yeah. but it was an analogy used to support the author's main point, not to show here's what some people say and here's what others So I think say. just reading it, like, just as we go through here, I probably would have kept it open because part of my mind was just thinking, oh, I guess... The analogy – I mean now that we're talking about more, you're absolutely right. But the analogy 
talks about someone calling someone and uh, hearing the message and someone else distributing the phone number. So I'm like, oh, like just as I'm reading it quickly, I could see the analogy illustrating the two sides of this debate, like the two components of it. But yeah, now that we're talking about it, it's, it's wrong. But I guess going quickly through these answers, my I probably would have crossed out A, kept B open, kept reading, and then, okay. you know, found something better and probably picked that and maybe not even have gone back to B or just double checked and been like, oh, okay, wait, the positions. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it certainly was an analogy. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. C. Show that the legal problems produced by new communication technology are not themselves new. I I just don't... The telephone answering machine thing, it never said, well, when telephone answering machines came out, we had the same legal issue. Yeah, this is way too broad. It doesn't... It's not about... The telephone answering machine was used as an analogy to show the author's position. Mm -hmm. Not the legal problems with a telephone answering mm-hmm. machine. D, illustrate the basic principle the author believes should help determine the outcome of the copyright. Oh, debate. that's perfect. That's the premise right there. Yeah. The author was trying to prove their point. Their point was, hey, I think I know how this copyright debate should come mm-hmm. out. I think we should not strengthen copyright. Let me show you an illustration with the telephone answering mm-hmm. machine. So yeah, it was used to prove the author's main point. My problem with B is that it was not used to just illustrate the two positions. Yeah. The telephone answering machine was part of the author's argument, mm-hmm. not a, Hey, here's what we're talking about. Here's what some people think. Here's what other people think, which is what B is yeah. describing. Okay. E show that telephone use also raises concerns about copyright. No, we don't care about it doesn't, as far as we know, raise concerns. Well, that's the off- that's the opposite of the author's yeah. point. The author is saying, hey, you would never copyright protect a telephone answering machine yeah. message. Okay, so it's D for 21. Cool. Okay, good. Last one. Ooh. Hmm? No. Sorry? Oh, yeah. yeah. You ready? Okay. <laughs> 22. According to the passage, present copyright laws, ooh, definitely predict Yeah. That. Present copyright laws should not change. Yeah, they're fine. They're perfect. They they do not need to be strengthened. A, they allow completely unrestricted use of any document (laughs) placed by its author on a web page. Way too strong. Yeah, completely unrestricted. No, no, no. You're not allowed to, like, copy it and print it in a book and sell it. I mean, it doesn't say that. No, it's... It does provide some restrictions. The argument of the other people is that they should be strengthened. Those restrictions should be increased. And this person is saying, no, leave those restrictions as they are. Right. B, allow those who establish links to a document on a web page to control its distribution to others. Right. Those who establish links? To a document? Yeah, it should say allow those who place the document on the web. Yeah, so right. not those who to link to the document. Not who made the links, yeah. So that's yeah. wrong. That's another trap. Like, it's easy to fall into that trap, huh? Of, like, thinking that establishing links confuse the people who are linking and the people who put it there. Yeah, because when I first saw the word establish, I think I almost started to think of that as the person who's has a, has put established there, put control over the document or established the document, but... Yeah, yeah. I I know I misread it too at first, but no, it's not B because B is about the linking. No, the the author does not think that the people who make a link are controlling the distribution. Yeah. In fact, the exact opposite of that. C, present copyright laws prohibit anyone but the author of a document from making a profit from the document's distribution. No, no, no. <sighs> profit was never mentioned. I'm just thinking, like, you can make a profit from – if you're not the author, as long as you make a, a, a deal with them, right? So it prohibits anyone but the author from making a profit. Like, why not make a profit? You have a licensing agreement with them or something. I mean, we just never talked about this, but I could see how this is yeah. not 
Right. And ac- by the way, the f- the question itself starts out by saying, according to the passage, this is even more strict than what is the author most likely to agree with. This has to just be straight up said. There is no possibility to yes. read between the lines. Like you said, you don't want to read Which, between the lines, but there's no not even a chance here for doing that. Right. Okay, D. Uh, present copyright laws allow the author of a document to sue anyone who distributes the document without permission. Again, it's way too strong, and we just don't know about this. The author never said this. Mm-hmm. Okay, I think it might have. Oh, it um, did say? I don't remember anyone talking about suing. Well, anyway, you're going to eliminate all five yeah. here because E should be altered to allow more complete freedom in the exchange of ideas. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's the, that's the opposite. They, they definitely didn't say that. The author said present copyright laws are, laws are yeah, fine. Yeah. So here, this might be one of the cases where, you know, you think you've eliminated all five and you have to start mm-hmm. over. But I think if you look back at D, it's not about internet. It, it It's just present copyright laws allow the author of a document to sue anyone who distributes the document without permission. Remember the author of this passage is saying that if you make a link, you are not. Oh, I see it right now. That's the whole I see point. 21. Yeah, what's the 21. Line? line 21 says, Sue, I didn't remember that, but it's also current copyright laws give owners of intellectual property, the right to sue a distributor of unauthorized. There you copies. Go. So yeah. what would happen here is I didn't remember them talking about suing, so I would have crossed out D, would have crossed out E. Then I would have said, okay, which ones are dead wrong? A is definitely wrong. B is wrong because those those are – B is the opposite. A is way too strong. C, um, I don't remember any discussion of profit. So I would probably end up going back and looking for C and D because I would say, well, maybe I forgot about profit. Maybe I forgot about suing. But it's actually not that hard to just scan over and Sue sticks right out on line 21. So then it's like, oh, there it is. I missed it. Okay. Uh, very good. So 22D. Um, do you, you think that's a – I feel like that's bad enough. Yeah, today. I think that's good. I'm kind of out of gas. Um, we will come back. I, I'm, I'm glad we did this. We can come back and we'll pick up that last passage uh, one of these days and maybe talk about those other games. Yeah. And then we'll be we will have completed talked about the entire June two thousand seven official. Yeah, that'll be good. Nice. Um, okay, everybody out there in internet world, you can uh, email the show that is help at thinkinglsat dot com. You can get me directly, Nathan at foxlsat dot com. Ben, uh, Ben at strategyprep dot com. Check out Ben's free online class. It's strategyprep dot com slash free. Same thing on my website, foxlsat.com slash free. Anything else you want to add today, man? No. Thanks for listening.